Medications injected into the subcutaneous or fatty tissues just beneath the dermis move into the bloodstream faster than they would if given by mouth, but slower than they would if injected into muscle or into a vein. This is because subcutaneous tissue contains fewer and smaller blood vessels, making this an appropriate route for slow, systemic absorption of small amounts of non-irritating aqueous solutions, such as insulin and heparin. The subcutaneous route is appropriate for injecting up to one milliliter of fluid. The medication must be water-soluble and strong enough to be effective, but it cannot be harmful to surrounding tissues. Into which areas is it safe to administer a subcutaneous injection? Most sites are safe, unless they cover a bony prominence, have large blood vessels, or are inflamed, excoriated, tender, or edematous. Subcutaneous injection sites should also be free of scar tissue, and they should not be on a limb that is paralyzed or inactive due to neurological impairment or joint disease. Common subcutaneous injection sites are the outer aspects of the upper arms and the abdomen, from just below the costal margins to the iliac crests. Other safe sites are the anterior aspect of the thighs, the scapular areas, and the upper ventrodorsal gluteal areas. For clients who receive subcutaneous injections regularly, it is important to rotate injection sites. Clients who have diabetes should choose one anatomic area and rotate injections within that site. This is because insulin is absorbed at different rates from different parts of the body, so rotating among areas could cause fluctuations in glycemic control. For example, insulin is absorbed fastest from the abdomen and the arms and slowest from the thighs and buttocks. It helps some clients to use an injection rotation diagram. They check off the specific site within the area when they self-inject and note the date and time as a reminder to move to the next site within that area for the next injection. Orderly rotation of injection sites minimizes tissue damage, keeps the medication absorption rate consistent, reduces discomfort, and prevents lipodystrophy, which is the wasting of subcutaneous fat. Next, you'll select the needle size and length based on the client's weight, the amount of subcutaneous tissue available at the selected site, and the angle of injection you'll use. A one or two milliliter syringe and an insulin syringe are the typical choices for subcutaneous injections. A good way to determine the insertion angle is to pinch the client's tissue at the site. If you pinch one inch of tissue, that's 2.5 centimeters, insert the usual half or 5 eighths inch needle at a 45 degree angle. If you grasp two inches of tissue, use a 90 degree angle with a 3 eighths to 5 eighths inch needle. A 25 or 27 gauge needle is appropriate, although 30 gauge, 5 16 inch needles are available on 30, 50, and 100 unit insulin syringes. Most clients prefer the shorter, thinner needles, as the injections are less painful and there is less risk of injecting the drug into a muscle. For obese clients, pinch the tissue and then select a needle long enough to insert through the epidermis and the dermis and into the fatty tissue. You might need a one inch needle injected at a 90 degree angle. The upper abdomen is the best injection site for very thin, emaciated clients or older clients who have minimal subcutaneous tissue. For these clients, use a 5 8 inch needle inserted at a 45 degree angle. Before administering a subcutaneous medication, ask the client about any drug allergies. Review information about the medication you are going to administer, including the action of the drug and any side effects, contraindications, or potential adverse reactions, and share the appropriate information with the client. If the client receives regularly scheduled injections of insulin or heparin, check the subcutaneous rotation diagram to choose the next site. Assess the site for inflammation, swelling, erythema, or tissue damage from previous injections. Finally, evaluate the client's ability to cooperate during the injection and make sure others are available to help as needed. Just a brief reminder about infection control. Remember that all parenteral injections are invasive procedures. To prevent infection, follow these basic rules. If the client's skin is noticeably soiled, wash it first. Wash your hands thoroughly before preparing the injection. Wear gloves because contact with blood is a possibility whenever you administer an injection. Withdraw medication immediately after opening an ampule or a vial. Do not let the needle touch unsterile surfaces such as the other outer edges of the ampule. 
the outer surface of the needle cap or your work surface. Do not touch the long part of the plunger or inner part of the barrel. Keep the syringe tip covered with a cap or needle. With an antiseptic swabber pad, use friction while cleaning the injection site in a circular motion. Cleanse from the center of the site and move outward. Now let's go ahead and demonstrate a subcutaneous injection of insulin. We'll assume the nurse has selected an appropriate site, needle size, and syringe, and has verified the client's identity, screened the client for allergies, and explain the procedure and has checked the medication record for the appropriate drug, dosage, route, and time. The nurse cross-checks the medication's label carefully with the medication record and examines the vial to check the expiration date and to make sure the contents are not inappropriately discolored or thickened and that no sediment has formed. She then assembles her equipment. She will need the insulin vial, the insulin syringe, the needle, gloves, and antiseptic swabs or pads. The nurse washes her hands, then rotates the vial between her palms for about a minute. She then opens the vial and withdraws the appropriate amount of insulin into the syringe. She provides privacy, then positions and drapes the client appropriately. She puts on clean gloves, then cleans the selected site with an antiseptic swab or pad according to agency policy. She starts at the center of the site, rotating and widening circle to about 2 inches or 5 centimeters. She then allows the site to air dry and positions the swab on the client's skin above the intended site. Next, she prepares the syringe for injection, pulling the needle cap straight off. She grasps the syringe in her dominant hand and uses her non-dominant hand to pinch the skin at the site. Then she inserts the needle at the predetermined angle with a firm, steady push and releases the skin. Then without aspirating, she uses the plunger to inject the medication with slow, steady pressure. The nurse then withdraws the needle quickly and places the antiseptic swab over the site, applying gentle pressure. She does not massage the site, both to avoid tissue injury and to keep the medication from being absorbed faster than intended. During and immediately after administration of any medication by injection, take precautions to avoid needle stick injuries. For example, never recap a used needle. If available, use any built-in safety features as the manufacturer directs. Discard used needles and other sharps in clearly marked puncture and leak-proof containers according to agency policy. Never place a used needle in a wastebasket, in your pocket, or at a client's bedside. Also, following an injection, assess your client carefully for any adverse effects of the medication, such as nausea, dyspnea, or skin rash. Watch for behavioral changes that could be a result of drug toxicity. Report any problems to the provider. Your ongoing assessment will also include evaluating that the medication is having the desired effect, such as glycemic control. Clients who are receiving insulin or heparin might have to self-administer subcutaneous injections at home. Teach the procedure to the client and family and give them written instructions to use at home. Help the client develop a rotation schedule and provide a chart he can use to keep track of the rotation plan. Make sure at least one family member becomes familiar enough with the procedure to be able to act appropriately in an emergency.